Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It has been quite some time and the format of this channel is now I come and go as I please. So I'll try to be coherent because I'm filming after a gap. The words do not come very easily to me, but I will try my best. And before we move on to the content of the video, I have a couple of housekeeping notes in the sense that I do not have the best lighting in my house. I have moved from room to room to room. And this is the best that I have because it's really dark and gray outside. And unfortunately, there's nothing else that I can do. It's like it's the middle of the day, but the light is just not there. And the second thing is that I am using this Bluetooth mic for the first time. And I'm really, really hoping that it picks up on the audio quickly because I'm planning to do a discussion video, which is going to be a bit long. And I don't think I'll be able to film it twice if I don't get it right the first time. So that's the second note. I really hope the sound is not as bad as I, I just hope the sound isn't bad, full stop. The third housekeeping note is that I live next to a really busy road. So occasionally you will hear sirens and police and I don't know who else outside, but it's going to be a bit noisy. And again, I wish I could do something, but I really don't. And the fourth housekeeping fact, the last one is the fact that I have two cats now and I've shut them outside because they don't really understand the concept of personal space, especially when I'm trying to film. I want to concentrate and not have them moving around. So I've shut myself in my bedroom and you will hear them scratching outside in case they're coming in. So basically this video is meant to be a discussion on Palestine and I'll be sharing some general thoughts, but I mostly want to talk about the books that I have been reading and the books that I'm planning to read. So I'll be initially sharing just a brief introduction, my thoughts, and then I'll slowly be moving on to the books. I have a fiction book, a poetry collection, and three non-fiction books to talk about. And I also have five pages of notes. So there will be a time when the laptop is in front of me. I'll try not to read directly, but I need it so just so that I know what I wrote in the reviews when I wrote them. And now moving on to just the general thoughts on discussion that like Palestine is something that has always been in our consciousness growing up in predominantly Muslim country. And you always hear about the struggle of our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine from a very young age. It's not something that, you know, you as a kid, you don't really know what it is. You just know that there are people who are being brutalized, but you don't really understand what the situation is. So that's something that's always been in our consciousness. And I feel like the genocide is kind of opening up the eyes of the rest of the world who may not have been aware of that situation. And as I have studied history before, this is something that is not new. It's not new information. Um, and the purpose of this video is just to share what I've learned from these books and educate myself and along the process, share that learning with others. Um, this video is not going to you know, entertain any discussions with people who might want to know, you know, probe me and say, what about the other side? But what about October 7th? Because honestly, I'm not interested in picking up a fight or just responding to those comments. Because if you're choosing to remain ignorant while I'm trying to share my learnings, that's just on you. Like, I'm not going to just respond to any ignorant comments, but I do want to encourage like a genuine discussion after this video. And one of the things that I kind of ex I'm experiencing on Bookstagram, I'm publicly posting about Palestine on my stories and the books that I've been reading. And even people from the reader community are telling me to take it down a notch. And I genuinely don't understand because it's my Bookstagram and I can do what I want. And there, people are telling me, oh, you worry too much about Palestine. And I'm thinking you're not worrying enough about Palestine because do you see the videos? Like, do you see what's happening? Why are you not thinking about this as much as you should be or as much as I am? But um, even if you're not, that's fine. But to tell me that I'm worrying too much is a little bit annoying to me because I'm just worrying fine. And there are other people who are telling me to take a break from the books, from the books that I'm reading. And I do understand that because after reading like a couple of nonfiction books, um, I did need a palate cleanser and I might read something light again, just so that I'm in the right headspace for the books that I'm planning to read ahead. But um, the fact that people are telling me to take a break and, you know, just, just be myself, do some self-care. And that is something that I honestly don't really get because I feel like my life in itself is a built-in break from what the Palestinians are facing. And what I mean by that is that I'm only looking at that through a screen. I'm not living it. I'm not breathing it. My loved ones are not in that situation. I'm in a safe home. 
I'm very happy and very comfortable with my family. I, my pets are taken care of. I have access to a warm shower, a hot cup of coffee or anything that I need. So that in itself is a break because people there do not have that. And right now for me to look away is a privilege. And that is something that I might not want to do because I want to educate myself. I want to participate because 10, 15 years down the line, when I think about what I was doing at the time, I want to know that I did something and I participated and I educated myself and I joined the protest and I just want to feel good about the fact that I did something, whatever I could in my power. And that's basically it. Like I want to participate. And if that's something that is not making anyone else comfortable, like you don't really have to watch this video. You don't have to follow me on Instagram. Just mute my stories and then we can all be, we can all be happy. So basically, um, I'm going to be talking about five books. As I mentioned, I think, um, a fiction, a poetry collection, three nonfiction books. And I'll add the timestamps in case anyone else doesn't really want to hear my thoughts, but they just want to know about the book. So you can just jump around and click on the, on the thing that you want to see. So I will be opening my laptop now. I'll try not to read directly, but I have written reviews and that is something that really does help me. Let's jump into it. The first book that I want to talk about is called Minor Detail by Adania Shibley. And like I mentioned, this is a fiction book which I read during 2021 when the occupation forces were um, taking over different neighborhoods of Jerusalem, namely Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan. And my memory of this is not as fresh as I wanted to. For those of you living in Toronto, I, do, I did see this book in Queen Books, um, like a physical copy and the same edition that I'm going to put a picture of. I really wanted to get it, but I've already read the book and I just wanted to Books are expensive and space is limited, so I just wanted to get something else because I have already read this book. But basically, um, this book is still relevant and the other books that I'll talk about are also still relevant because the people who have written these books are still suffering despite having shared their accounts. And Adanya Shibli is one of those people because this year she was supposed to get a book prize in Germany and she could not because uh, she was denied solely on the basis of her identity, which is something that's not ideal. So this book again um, is relevant because the author is still struggling with her, with her success, with her achievements because she is being denied. But moving on to the content of this book. Now this book is set in two parts. The first is set in 1949, which is the first year after the Nakba. The Nakba is the catastrophe as the Palestinians called it when they were forced to leave their homeland. And around that time, around 750,000 Palestinians were forced to expel the place and leave their villages and their cities. Um, so in the year 1949, in this section, we find ourselves in the name of an unnamed character. And he's basically an Israeli military soldier. And he is, we read this book from being in his headspace from his perspective which is very di a disturbing place to be because they find um they go around the desert and try to find arabs and kill them so while they're looking for people to kill in this scenario a young palestinian girl falls prey to the israeli soldiers and meets a traffic fate and now in the second section of the book is set 25 years later where a young woman kind of comes across the story and she wants to know what happened and uh, she tries to investigate this incident and tries to make phone calls and find out what happened just to see more details and she wants to learn more. In both of these scenarios, that is the first and the second one, the reader is with the unnamed characters and goes through the horrific events with them. It is an uncomfortable place to be as we are forced to face the hor horrifying calamities of war, ethnic cleansing and living under occupation. The author showcases the anxiety of the second narrator really well and the reader really feels suffocated in her skin. Living under constant scrutiny, one fears for the narrator as she is not able to move freely and constantly finds herself in places where she's not supposed to be. Because while she's trying to investigate this history, we come across these barriers, these physical and these mental barriers that she has to go through. She is trying to get to different places through checkpoints where she is not allowed to be because the settlers are not really allowing her and have confined her to a certain space. And in this story, we do come across this investigation from a point of view of erasure that like Palestinians are not really allowed any access to their own history and it has completely been um, overwritten or <laughs> I can't come up with another word, but it has basically, basically been rewritten from the point of the um, 
from the point of view of the Isra uh, Israeli occupation forces. So we really do feel for her because she's really trying to find out and whatever she finds out, it's not quite sitting well with her. The writing style of this book is very sparse, but despite this, the imagery is very vivid and the author uses simple devices such as the barking dogs, the smell of gasoline, etc., to tie the two chapters together. Not only does the, that make the book more interconnected, but the simple details really make one think of how similar the two scenarios are. Um, I remember this book was a little over 100 pages, and I read it over a week. Normally, I'm quite a slow reader, but a 100-page book is two days at best for me because I can divide it into 50 and 50, but I remember this book was heavy. So anytime you're reading about these kind of books, I do recommend exercising a certain amount of caution, but just read with an open mind. Now, moving on to the second book. This one is a poetry collection. It's called Rifka by Muhammad Al-Kurd. And Muhammad Al-Kurd and his sister are basically twins from Palestine. And they're both, I, I believe they're 25 right now. So they're really, really young. And I first heard of them again during 2021 when um, Mona, the sister, filmed the, a video of um, someone taking over her family home. And she is arguing, arguing with him that you're stealing my home. And the person in the video responds that if I don't steal it, someone else will. So that video is online for anyone to see. But that's when I first became aware of the of the twins, the siblings. So basically, this collection is written by Muhammad al Kurd, And generally, poetry collections are not for me. Like, I don't really engage with poetry that much because I honestly, sometimes it just goes over my head. It's a, a format that I don't really enjoy, but I still wanted to read it and kind of amplify Palestinian voices. And again, it was, I wanted to know from the perspective. So... This book is called Rifka because it's written in the memory of Muhammad al kurds grandmother, and it is one written from the heart. It covers the Palestinian plight in detail, sharing from his childhood to living under a military occupation and then appearing on Western media channels. One of the things that he does in this book is the fact that he uses incidents that happened in Palestine. For example, if like two teenagers were shot on a beach, um, he would write a poem about them. So there are many incidents that happened that were very relevant during his life and childhood that he has dedicated a poem to. So there's a few poems that really stood out to me. And unfortunately, when I was reading this, it was a library book. I took screenshots, um, but I didn't really capture the name of the poem or anything else. I just highlighted the few lines that I liked and those are the ones that I'm going to read. There's one that I really liked about the olive trees. And I don't know if people are aware of this image, which I'm going to post here, about this woman holding on to her olive tree on her family's farm, which the, which the occupation forces wanted to take down. They wanted to uproot the, the tree. And this picture, in a lot of ways, is heartbreaking because you can see the woman is holding on to the tree for dear life. And there's just a military jeep in the background ready to take it down. So about this, he said, a chain is corseting, the tr tree's waist and hers, flesh in flesh, olive skin on olive skin. Fingers, branches, intersection, rootedness jars their storms, wraps them in her unbreakable word, we will not leave, leave. A pulling pressure soldiered, occupiers occupy her limbs, untangling a grandmother. A soldier as old as a leaf born yesterday, pulls a trigger on a woman older than his heritage. The next few lines I liked in a different poem are, The morning of a red, red sky in May, 1948, could have been today. They knocked the doors down, claimed life as their own, the chances of their staying fragile. But now look, houses are in ruins, keys around necks, odds far from even, far from running water. Another example, here we know two sons, Earth's friend and white phosphorus. Here we know two things, death and the few breaths before it. And the last few lines I'm going to share are from a different poem, which is about his experience with media interviews in the West. And he says that what is a fact in Arabic is debatable in English, contentious. Thing is, I couldn't care less. Say evict and I'll still say theft. Now, the third book I'm going to talk about is called, they called her a lioness, a Palestinian girl's fight for freedom by Ahad Tamimi and Dina Takturi. So Ahad Tamimi is basically a Palestinian activist from the village of Nabi Saleh in the West Bank. And basically this book um, details her social media, uh, a video of her well went viral. She made, got made famous 
she became famous after she slapped uh, a soldier uh, as he was trying to take over her home and that video became ri uh, viral she got arrested she was detained for eight months and this book basically details the account of what happened during that time like from her childhood how the village where she lived kept getting smaller and smaller and areas where they could generally access kept getting smaller and smaller as the settlements grew so places where they could play as in childhood they could not go anymore and while writing this book there is a childlike innocence to her because she was a very young girl when this book came out but at the same time when children are subjected to such cruel things they don't really remain children so at the time of writing, she mentions that her home was raided over 150 times by the soldiers. Sometimes they would arrest her parents, her mother, her father, her brothers. And after she slapped a soldier, she was arrested herself and kept in detention in the worst possible conditions for eight months. In this book, she discusses the apartheid system and how the Palestinian people have to go through the military court system, while a civil court is reserved for the people on the other side. Under the apartheid rule, Palestinians can only drive on certain, no, on certain roads as they are issued separate number plates, while other citizens get to drive on smoother roads. So for Palestinians, there's a lot of barriers and, you know, they don't get different, they get different treatment. It's preferential treatment that the other side gets. And the fact that these are such clear apartheid rules, and as we know about the apartheid in South Africa, that you have different rules for different people and different rules for different identities and that is what is currently happening so one of the things that i noticed is that while she was facing these detention and these courts like she was absolutely fearless in her book like she the way that she comes across is like she, nothing can terrify her she's not afraid of anything she knows she's on the right side of history she knows there has been theft but the constant mental brutalization of her and her family and the way that she was threatened while she was detained is something that a lot of like Palestinians face and she says in her book that she's not the first Palestinian to go through this treatment but because she has like blonde hair and blue eyes a lot of people really started to recognize and see themselves in her because she looked different and not what people imagine Arabs to generally look like. And again, this is another one of those examples where the author is still um, suffering because even after having raised her voice and written this book and going to university in, in the West Bank, at the beginning of the genocide, Ahad Tamimi was arrested once again. And I believe she was released at the end of November from what I, what I remember reading. Um, and the fact that she is so strong-willed and I read, I was in her head for so long while reading this book, when I saw the footage of her release a couple of months ago, like that footage is terrifying to watch because you know that clearly she's shaken. And for someone who is so strong-willed and has such a fiery spirit, to see them like that was really, really disturbing. Now, the next book that I want to talk about is called Palestinian Walks by Raja Shahade. And I had such a hard time with this book reading it on audiobook because it went completely over my head. There's words and names of places and terminologies and i just wasn't getting any of it so i bought a physical copy and um, i don't know where it is so i'll pop up a picture but i basically read this book on on physical copy so this book is basically the documentation of six walks in palestine that the author took from 1978 to 2006. he's basically a palestinian lawyer and he's an author and he basically used to assist his clients in matters of the land. And this is a very interesting take on the occupation because as the settlers were growing in number and they were taking over more land, there were more people coming to this author who were contesting the illegal takeover of the land. Um, when settlers began taking over Palestinian land, the author was faced with such issues where the settlers and the occupiers would use the ambiguities in the law to take advantage of that. So for example, if there's a farmer and they know the landmarks, like there's a tree and this is where our farm ends and they would use physical markers to identify their land. This kind of ambiguity was basically used against them um, by the occupiers because they thought that they don't have enough language, um, enough knowledge of the land. And other things basically were the Palestinians owned land, but they were not physically present. So that land was considered public land and then it was given up uh, to the settlers where they built their homes. Now, the physical treks in this book described are also really interesting because I'm not a great walker, but I do really like going for walks in nature. Um, I'm from Islamabad, so it's on the foot of the hills. 
So I used to hike there quite a lot. And even here, like I have explored quite a few walking trails that I really enjoyed. So I definitely enjoyed it from that aspect of just learning more about, you know, more about hills because I grew up watching hills. Like my the city I'm from is on the basis of the hills. So reading about the hills on Palestine was also quite interesting in a way. So basically, this book showcases the beauty of the Ramallah Hills, how aesthetically pleasing the land was, but the settlers made their homes on top of the hills, obstructing the view. And they basically set up a wall, which was a permanent wall, and they made their homes on top of these hills, which, again, to give them an advantage so that they could see the places. And they had no consideration for the topography or the geography, but also the people moving into those settler homes had a very different attitude towards the Palestinians because they were definitely treated um, differently and looked down on. And because of these structures and these walls, the Palestinian locals, even if there were kids going to school or people who are going to work, they had to take detours because if you're if two hills are connected and there's a wall in the middle, they had to find a longer way. And because of this, a lot of Palestinians couldn't get to work on time. They lost their income. And basically, they were going there to build their homes. Like the Palestinians working were working as laborers. So they would have to get there, but they wouldn't get there on time because of these obstructions. And it's definitely such a tough situation to be in because how do you expect them to live? So the walks are documented in Ramallah Hills, area where the author could initially walk without any interruption change as the settlements grew with time. While he was walking, he has been shot at in these hills. He has been threatened with arrest and constantly talks about the olive trees. And the olive trees are very significant in the Palestinian history, as you mentioned, but you also see that how they were treated when the lands were in the possession of the Palestinians and how that changed once the, once the settlers started taking. So one note that I would have on this book is that it is dense because it talks about the topography of the land. It talks about geography, it talks about physical features. It talks about the law and different cases. Not something that's super easy to read, um, but it is something that I would highly recommend. And the last book that I want to talk about is called The Hundred Years War on Palestine by Rashid Khalidi. This is a book that I also read in 2021. And I read it as a group read. And it basically uh, highlights the history of Palestine from 1917 to 2017. And it goes through the Zionist movement, the beginnings of the Zionist movement, how, you know, they kind of raised funding, the role that the British Empire had to play in it, the British mandate, the Six Days War, and many, many subsequent events. And in itself, each chapter in this book is a book. So again, you have to read it with the point of view of learning because it can be very dense. And just to be met, and it's one of those books that's meant to be, for me, consumed slowly so you can understand and learn more. And one of the more outstanding factors of this book was that this author uses his own family records, his own family archives and histories to share his perspective and goes through these events. This is a perspective that's really valued because you will see Palestinian history through the eyes of many different people, but rarely will you see a person using their own family archives and their own, their own histories to kind of document what is happening to their people. Now, those are my thoughts on the five books that I read. There are three more books that I will be reading. I have Erasing Palestine by Rebecca Ruth Gould, Free Speech and the Pal Palestinian Freedom. And basically, this book kind of discusses the idea of conflating support for Palestine and calling it anti-Semitic. So this is one I'm really looking forward to. The second one is by the same author who wrote um, Palestinian Walks. It's his memoir. We Could Have Been Friends, My Father and I, a Palestinian memoir by Raja Shahade. So again, these books are not that long, but they're quite dense and it might take me some time to make part two of this video. And I'm just skimming through it. And there's also like family photographs and things like that, which really, really add to the experience. So I'm glad I have a physical copy. And the third book that I have on ebook, I have it from the library. So I guess I have it for two weeks. I should get on with it. And it's Light on Gaza. And that is one that I wanted to buddy read with Charlotte. And I don't know if she's consumed it already, but I don't know if I'll be able to. But regardless, I'll still be reading it and sharing my thoughts. So that's it for this video. It took me a long time to make it, but here we are. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you soon.